fraudulent well I was going to say religion is a kind of religion but it's a fraudulent science I'm not saying that psychiatrists are bad so I said I don't think judges are bad I don't think lawyers are bad it's a system that's evil and the evilness of psychiatry is for a, a, a discipline to come together that can't even answer the location of the mind they don't know they don't think it's relevant and yet they're making presumptions of our mind without even knowing where it exists and if they don't know where it exists how do they even know it exists they don't it is a complete fraud complete fraud so of course when they respond to you and they say how dare you to say well honestly if you don't know where the mind is located how can you possibly and competently make any kind of assessments on mind competency and of course they can't so I hope some of these latest sections help you there's a lot of things on there that uh, are there to help uh, and I and I look forward to your feedback on that and we will continually to improve those now in the time left before we ask questions I just want to fill in some of the the blanks in terms of uh, background that we've gone through in the past particularly about the three forms of law the three forms of court because I know some of you are getting this reaction what are you talking about this is all crazy stuff so let me just cover some of those points one sec okay the first is how did we get here in this legal system <laughs> about the name of the court the three forms of law in the court the three forms of court using recess as a way of changing the form or running away and coming back in changing the form how do we get to this well before the 19th and 18th century there weren't dedicated courthouses and if you take the English model there were a number of courts by then there was a court of common pleas there was a court of chancery there was a crown court uh, there was a court of the exchequer there's obviously court of admiralty but there are a number of courts these courts a number of these courts would would tour at least twice a year to each county and unlike the court of the sheriff or the court of the magistrate which was really there to round up a stranger and hang them summarily out the front of an inn after judging them for 30 seconds these courts were really reserved for uh, people with property people of senior standing to have their matters resolved now when they came to a county they didn't meet in an inn they'd, they'd meet in in a, in a reasonably uh, noble type setting they wouldn't meet at the court of the bishop because the bishop's power was considered quite separate in in, in the highest court there was but it would it would meet at say a keep a castle a, a significant building and what that means is that in the same hall of a count uh, of a of a baron of a um, uh, of a lord um, what they would do is they would have the same uh, setting but different forms of court so this is the precedent that as these courts toured to these regional areas they would meet in the same hall and they wouldn't dress up the hall differently it would be different forms of court in the same building now when in the 18th and 19th century they started to build dedicated courthouses this precedent continued that different forms of court the court of equity then uh, the court of common pleas would continue uh, the court of admiralty the court of chancery these different forms would still meet now in this dedicated courthouse but with the difference that you would know that one court had finished hearing and then the new form of court would start they would let you know that now all that's changed so if someone says to you about the three forms of court and then changing the form of court is complete rubbish it's not all they've done is the system has become so automated they don't tell you openly that you're about to enter a new court they simply say there's a brief recess and without you noticing one clerk leaves and another clerk enters and we look forward to the feedback and I ask all of you to consider this 
because we've always been focusing on the judge, we haven't even looked to see the changing of the role of the clerks because clerks come and leave all the time and we don't think about that. We see them as administrative staff of the court, but the clerks are the power. This is what we're saying about trust. The clerks represent the legal title of Franco Collins when I go to court. I'm only the equitable title. The clerk is the legal title. The judge is there as the administrator. The prosecutor is there as the, uh, as the executor in terms of Sesta KV. And then, of course, they've got a Sesta KV, a, a constructive trust for the matter itself running through. So we've been looking at the wrong power in the court and not noticing the shifting of the clerks. So they just don't tell us now. But it's not some weird and fanciful conspiracy that's happened overnight. It's just a logical evolution where they, they have come to the conclusion that we're too stupid now to even deserve to be told because we should know it ourselves. Well, that is an unmitigated fraud and it must come to an end. But it can be easily explained because it has a historic precedent. And the same with the law, because with the form of the court came the law. If you're going to hear a, a, a case in the court of chancery, then you're going to deal with chancery law, equitable law. If you're going to talk about admiralty court, then you're going to hear it under maritime law. If you're going to be under court of common pleas, then it'll be under common law. So the form of law comes with the court. Again, it's not weird and wonderful conspiracy. It's perfect logical sense. The system has continued to automate and simplify and streamline. But the precedents were set long, long ago. This, another precedent, you know, we talk about bar associations. The concept of a guild dedicated and closing off the law to the exclusion of others did not uh, suddenly appear in the 19th century. The first form was under the Florentine guilds, the 12 guilds of Florence, from which we get many of the modern concepts of, of commerce and trade. And when that was transported across to England, it became the 12 libraries or liveries. And one of those was the library of judges and notaries or the guild of judges and notaries. But they weren't judges and notaries as, as we would be seem to believe or, or told that they uphold the law. They were there to uphold the commercial law. And the way to think about the, the way the law views to a, to a judge, a lawyer, because honestly, as I said, the first thing, the first group they lie to are the lawyers, their own. The first people they lie to are their own. So in many cases, these men and women, who are by and large very good, have no idea whatsoever. Think of it as a wedding cake. At the top level, they talk about it being common law. We know it's commercial, but that's the top level. Is it common? Is it commercial? It's one or the other. It's procedural, administrative. Underneath that, we've revealed that, in fact, no, it's trust law that is the real power in the court. But there is actually a third level because many people ask me, who wrote the, common, who wrote the, the canons of law? How do you claim these canons of law as being the law? What's the basis of these canons being the law? Well, the third layer underpinning the system of law that we deal with is fundamental foundations of law, and in more particularly, foundations of law from the time of Charlemagne, the Pippins, the Franks, where your vow, your oath, your word, your consent is what gives life to the law, not procedure, not trusts, your vow, your oath, your consent, your participation brings life to the law. And that is the foundation even of their legal system. And you take away the vow, you take away the oath, you take away the consent, their entire edifice, their cake collapses without a foundation. And that is a foundation. And under Charlemagne, he didn't have courts. He had two forms of judgment, uh, groupings for judgment. He had a thing called placitum, from which we get place, for dealing with minor matters, placitum, P-L-A-C-I-T-U-M, placitum. And for serious matters, there was melum, 
So malum was serious, from which you get malice, and bad. Malum was for serious matters. So you had placitum and malum. The word court did not exist. In fact, it was the Florentine system that invented the word court. And the word court does not come from cohorts or some outside area. It comes from courtio, C-A-U-T-I-O, courtio in Latin. And what does it mean in Latin in law? It means simply security, bond, and bail. Because under the Guild of Judges and Notaries of Florence, they were concerned with converting people's oaths and vows and promises into in memoriam documents and commercializing them, bonding them. And that is the origin of court. It has nothing to do with law. It has everything to do with commerce and their feet are made of clay. Courtio, C-A-U-T-I-O, security, bond, bail. Latin, security, bond, bail. That is the origin of court. And all that they claim about the origin of court is complete rubbish. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you and give everyone, even the judges and lawyers who are reading this and trying to make sense in their spare time, an understanding of the history of how we come to be where we are. And in that process, we hope that it will assist you and it will assist them. Honestly, I don't know how this year will turn out. All I know is that over two and a half thousand years ago, the divine made a promise that this is the end of a reign of 1260 years of evil. How that comes about, I really don't know. I have an inkling that it has to do with each and every one of you. But what transpires, good or bad, is ultimately going to be something that will come through um, what we do. But I will not uh, give up and I will certainly help each and every one of you as, as, as I can. Now I want to talk about the last thing that I, I promised which was the important changes and then I will open up for questions. One of the realisations is that for every organisation that has ever been created and there is the necessity for a hierarchy one of two things have happened. Either they have been taken over or they have been destroyed. Now in the case of conveying property rights from the top down, United America, uh, which is a, an existing website, needs a lot of work, uh, is the charter is in fact a trust, a trust of a deed of trust, and that it needs trustees. Indeed, so is the Globe Union. So is uh, the Virginia Free Society, so is uh, United Britain. They're all forms of trust. And into those trusts we wish to and we will be conveying the rights, the clear title rights that uh, people have every right uh, to have without the Roman cult. And in that we will be totally destroying the Roman cult system. The problem is having competent trustees. Now, two years ago, I asked a number of exceptionally men and women to help me in being notaries along this journey. It was never the intention of that group to be gatekeepers. It was never the intention of those people to determine what they agreed with or disagreed with in terms of divine inspiration. They, they were there to assist. As I'm sure you appreciate, over time what happens is people become comfortable with their power, they become comfortable with certain positions and they find it difficult to change. Now that's not a, a criticism on anybody. In fact, one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest causes of failure of any idea is that the founder or the messenger or the author or the prime speaker starts to dominate the message and starts to integrate themselves with the message to the point that they overshadow the message. They become the focus rather than the message. And that is a real risk that I face. Equally so, when people are appointed, no matter how noble the reason, uh, 